Hi, friends. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. Transformation is happening in the outer world. A similar transformation needs to happen in the inner world so that the two can meet each other. One of the interesting people I've gotten to know over the years is money. It's not the same money, the moolah, but there's a different kind of money here. Money worked in technology for many, many years, and now he's working on the technology of the heart. So money, tell us your story. How did you go from the external abundance to the internal abundance, if you will? Thanks for inviting me into the space. And as you rightly said, inner transformation is what I have been working on. For all of us, there is some interesting element in the technology space you mentioned. I started off on what I call an external technology or outer technology, which is I did my computer science engineering and then I went to B school. I worked in Silicon Valley, uh, did that for a couple of decades. It's been a fantastic ride. I had a nice house and swimming pool and three cars in the front in the Bay Area. One day I woke up and said, what about my inner technology and inner science and inner tools? How does it work correlated with the outer technology to create impact, which is either at an individual personal level or at a 10 to the power 9 billion, which is why we used to work companies like HP and Yahoo. So or at 10 to the power 9 level, which is a billion people that we have, or at a microscopic and nanoscopic level that we also have look at. Because we, to me, the continuum of cosmic and, and atomic or quantum with the public in the middle, which is all kind of connected. And that is what I wanted to explore at that time. This is about 2011. So I kind of told my wife that uh, let's go back to India where I did my engineering and where I'm from. And she said, why? We have a nice house, nice everything. Kids are going to school. Well, let's try it out, see what happens. At that time, my daughter said, I want to go to London, Scotland, Ireland, and, and uh, you know Wales. And I said, wow, that's an interesting, what's up there? I wanted to get international exposure. So that got me thinking, my daughter was born in US, my wife was born in India, and her ma my mother was born in a small village. Where would I have my daughter's pregnancy and delivery? Will that be, dad, I'm in space in one, two, three. Why don't you come up and take the space elevator and come and meet me? And then you'll be in zero gravity for a few days, but that's okay. You'll get used to it. And then you can help me out with the delivery. This is kind of the thought that arose in me as a future vision. So I said, well, if that be the case, what can I give? And what I wanted to give was what was real for them and meaningful and authentic. And I did not want them to create yet another thing. So I went back to India, did a lot of interesting things, fell into yoga, Kriya Yoga, and a whole bunch of other things, worked with, with villages. Until then, I was working with Wall Street type of customers. I became an executive coach. Slowly but steadily, I moved from what I call scarcity to abundance, which is one of the movements that I was focused on. So there is quite a bit of inner abundance that's coming from just aligning the inner science and outer science, inner technology and outer technology and inner tools and outer tools. Wow, exciting, exciting. So money, this sounds so fascinating that you followed your heart's journey and then got into this inner engineering, trying to understand what this person in here wants to do. What was it like being at HP and Yahoo? Must have been very fulfilling doing creative technologies, being on business side. The outer technology was fantastic. I was a computer science Greek. I did math and physics and science, all those things. There was not too many human elements. Whereas in the human element, one plus one was like three, one and a half, 11. What do you want it to be? All those answers might come out as multiple choice. So therefore, I found that it is very definite. At that point of time, for me, computers and in the definitive answers was the way I was wired at that time. There was a little bit of me that looked at the unknown uncertainty and sometimes even ignored it. Working in HP, to tell you the truth, it was it was a blast. I was working from all the way from micro level optimization to language programming and working with nonstop computers at that time, ATMs and, and stock exchanges. There is a story that we used to have. We used to support all of HP, tandem computers. If, if you had any downtime, it used to be a Wall Street Journal reporting kind of item. So it was that kind of a mission critical work that we did. In Yahoo, it was big data, cloud, and all the information technologies that we used to do at low latency delivery. We did that at, at internet scale of uh, 65 billion events across 28 colos across the world. So it was fantastic work. It gave me a lot of money and a lot of satisfaction for sure. But always there was a lingering feeling of what is success? Is it just pursuit of happiness as you define it, or is there more to it? There is fulfillment or a satisfaction element that I need to plug into it. And that question always I had as a, what I call a 
residual question after reading my own story when I reflect on it. Yahoo and HP was fantastic, but there was more out there for me to explore. That's kind of how I look at it. Many people see this as a conflict, inner and outer. Oh, I'm so happy when I'm meditating. I don't want to go to work. Or when I go to work, I, buy, I get to buy a Tesla or I get to buy a big house. But I'm not sure if I want to just waste my time sitting and meditating. So in what ways did your external journey working on some of the latest and greatest technologies. In what ways did it prepare you for this journey that you're going through today? It's, it's in a way, it's the same journey as I see it, except with a different set of tools that you need to use. The outer journey primarily use your intellect. The inner journey, you have to use a different aspect. I'm calling it as inner presence. And, and there are various words, various terms that describe it in various literature. The presence is what I call a person plus essence. What is your true essence? If I were to say, Shankar, what are you made up of? If I if I reduce you to all its micro parts, what will it be remind? And similarly, I ask my question, what is my essence? And that is one piece that I need to add to my persona to create my presence. And that presence, when it when when it shows up in my intellect, it shows up as innovations and creativity. If it shows up in my heart, it, it shows up as poems and other things that I write, or stories that I can write. If it shows up in other places, it helps me create a good relationship with my wife and other places. So you think of it as electricity. How you power it? You can power a fan, it can power a light, it can power this computer that we are using to talk and internet and whatever else. So it's the same energy that you can power different appliances. And that's kind of how I saw the unity coming together, all of it. To me, that is where the connection, where I could go things beyond what my intellect could do. Intellect has a logical limitation of what it can do, whether it is ma finite theory mathematics or physics. We have an element of what is known and what is unknown. And the unknown, we are trying to slowly peel off by discovering new things or innovating new things. And that's fine. That's great. But I was a little greedy. I want to know it all. And I had only, if you were to go by this theory of one life to live, I have YOLO. I have, you only live once. I have to figure it out all at once. And therefore, I was a little greedy. And not greedy using intellect as the vehicle, because I knew that it had a limitation. Last so many 10,000, 15,000 years when science is at play, it's not discovered everything it needed to. There were other means that I wanted to find. Sounds very idealistic. You yeah. mentioned that, one plus one equals two in digital logic, very true. But one plus one could be zero if two people are fighting with each other. Or one plus one could be infinity if they're in bliss, right? That sounds like quantum physics or relativistic quantum mechanics. What yes. kind of logic can be used to explore the inner world if it's not the logic that is used in computers or at least in digital computers? How do you go about looking at the trajectory of the heart? We can look at computing through various motion, effective computing, quantum computing is coming up. So I'm hopeful that technology has its own roadmap of achieving certain things like this. What I found is that the scientists and physicists and technologists have been exploring this for the last hundreds of years, and they're not cracked it, whereas in other places, they have cracked it. So therefore, I wanted to use what is their logic. I wanted to understand their logic first before articulating it to you. And that is the journey I have been in. Some of the learnings I have heard is have blown my mind. I'll give you one small example as a way to articulate this logic. I used to play volleyball and I used to be good at it. So I was playing volleyball in one of the store local tournaments. I went up for a nice spike and saw the ball in the right place, hit it. When I came down, my knee was landing in a place where it was like a APCL extension, hyperextension is what happened. It was very painful for about a couple of minutes. I literally started crying. This is when I was 46. I'm not very emotional or very macho man, but pain does interesting things to you. So therefore I said, okay, now I have pain. So I have a choice of going to the regular doctor and fixing me up through MRI and usual technologies that, uh, that works. But I tried an alternate route. I said, okay, what if I don't want any surgery, microscopic or laparoscopic to go inside me? And if I have to solve it by myself, and this was my journey, can I do it? If so, how do I do it? If not, what is the pain of it? I'll tell you what the pain of it, the suffering of it, very simple. I used to play volleyball and soccer with my daughter. This was difficult, whereas this moment was easy, whereas this moment, cutting movements were difficult right, for the same knee. So I could not play volleyball, uh, soccer but I could play swimming and other things. 
So this was not a palatable lifestyle for me. So I had to work at this. So I found some interesting techniques like Kriya Yoga and other things which I did. And one day I was sitting quietly in meditation and my knee was still in pain. This is my year, af uh, year after I learned the Kriya Yoga. And boom, something went like a laser laparoscopic within myself. That's what I felt as a, as a subjective experience. I'm not articulating it as an objective, scientific, verifiable thing. But when I did that, my pain went away and I was able to come back and ski out here. I'm a good black diamond skier. Now I'm able to ski and other things I could do in Virginia where I am. This would not have been possible if I had not figured out some of this logic. At this point of time, am I able to articulate that logic? No. I'll give you an example. I use this phone. There are thousands of technology in here. I don't know how it works, but I know how to use the phone, right? At that level, at the user level, it gets me to where I want to go. And that is the place where I'm coming from right, right now in terms of these technologies. I'm a good user of some of these inner technologies, inner sciences and inner tools. If you are asking me as a question of, of a scientist level, show it to me how it works. Well, I'm a clueless. I will admit that. But I'm a good user. I'm getting better at it every day. Wow. Well, I have too many parallels with you. My team actually designed part of the power circuitry within one of the older Apple phones. So mm -hmm. it was exciting, but I will not claim to know this entire device because it's way too complex for any one person to know. In fact, exactly. some AI algorithm designed 90% of it. Thank you for sharing that. So what kind of tools have you found useful? In the inner logic, understanding what's happening within. The, the tools are very simple. It starts with what your identity is. For example, if I ask you, Shankar, who are you? You might say, I'm a podcaster. If I ask me, I, I'm an executive coach. These are all the identities that we share with the world, which is important for an external transaction that we do with the world. When I am sitting quietly by myself, Am I a man or am I an Indian or am I this or am I that? None of that is meaningful. If you drop all the identities that are externally important, what is left at that point in time is only certain identities. I'm a life for sure. That is the starting place. If I am a life, what do I do with it? I'm sitting quietly in a room. I have this leg pain. Pain is caused at the moment when you fell, but suffering lasts for a much longer time. And suffering is generally optional. And this is the first thing you understand. And this is the discernment that you use to use your, in other words, you can use the intellect as a, as a cutting thing to say what is required, what is not required. What is not required, you just throw it away. And that discernment gets you to place, this is the problem to be solved. In most of our cases, identifying and defining the problem is the first challenge and that takes significant amount of time. And once you have identified and defined the problem, then you can go about solving it either by yourself or through some other help. And this is the same process I followed very scientifically. I said, okay, this is what my problem is. I need to solve this. My objective was I wanted to explore and know the world one shot. How do I know that? There is various challenges associated with it. So I reduced the problem to a simple problem. I want to know myself. What is my beginning? What is my end? How does it go? And what am I made of? What is my essence? There are some simple questions that you can ask. And for that, what simply we found out is certain identity that you can take on. For example, you can take on what you call a cosmic identity, which is I'm not limited to this human being, this limitations. And then you can start building tools on top of it to say that this activity that you're doing can be done with much more efficiency and effectiveness and impact if you do certain activities. For example, the breath that we take, sometimes pay attention to it, sometimes we don't pay attention to it, we take it for granted. But that is the only thing that is there connecting us to life. When you are awake, when you are asleep, when you are deep sleep without dreaming, REM sleep stage, we still have the breath going. So it's very clear that we are not breathing, even though breath happens to us. If the breath doesn't happen to us, then life kind of escapes. And that is the simplest test when people do. If somebody is alive or dead, they check in the, near the nose. If he's not breathing, he's dead. That's the simplest test they can do, non-scientific. So what I said was, okay, the breath seems to be an interesting tool for us to explore with. And that goes beyond certain pieces like the body that we have and the mind that we use for external transactions. Internal transaction starts with the breath awareness as a, as a starting place, and you can go deeper into it based on the type of breath that you use and various other tools. These are all just base small tools I'm saying. 
they are all based on certain science and they can be converted into technology just like you would do, just like an iPhone. You can start using it. At the end of the day, are you becoming an expert user or are you becoming a dumb user? This is the question. All of us have body. Therefore, all of us have the same science, technology and tools and all of us are breathing. Therefore, we can do something with it. Our question is, have we learned the user's manual, which can help us use it better? And that is for me in our engineer. Let me get back to the question that you started with, which is trying to understand who am I? Money at this point in your life, are you able to answer that question? Not for yeah. others, but for yourself? Yes. So who I am is based on, I have various roles that I take on. For example, I have a family and two kids. When I'm there, I'm a husband, parent. Those are all simple rules. But what happens is when there is a conflict, we talked about some demands come from work, some demands from client. That's when I have to choose, should I shift into my work role, which is important? What are the priorities? And what are the places where we cannot be in more than one place at the same time? That's where it gets interesting. These liminal places, it's not from nine to five, I'm going to go to work. That's very clear. Nowadays, we, all of us post-COVID, we're all working from home. Therefore, work is home, home is friend. There's no work-life balance. All of them has gone. And also with the AI and, and other climate change and other challenges that is going to come, it's going to get even worse. In that sense, we talk about conscious leadership or situational leadership or various other elements. I work with a lot of leaders in big tech companies, especially who move countries and, and very smart, very bright, and they're all doing a lot of innovation. Fundamentally, what trips them up. When I say trips them up, they get angry, they get cancer, a whole bunch of other health-related problems because they are not keeping their inert in a healthy way. How do I do that? And that's where it is. For me, my definition is if I'm able to switch from one to another seamlessly, that is number one definition. Number two definition is am I able to feel all the emotions that are about predominantly just like RGB colors, there are nine fundamental emotions called Navarasa or nine emotions and variations of thereof. Permutation combinations is what the rest of the emotions are. Can I feel any of these emotions and come back to what I call a white paper state? How quickly can I come back to that normal? Suppose if I want to get angry at you because you've not done something and which you promised, I get the point across to you, you get it, and I can come back to normal state. And I can do that in a way that is compassionate. So to me, these are the two pieces that need to come together. So number one is, can I experience all the emotions and articulate it way without any causing pain? Because at the end of the day, what happens is when you do anger, when you do other things, hatred, you are poisoning yourself. And if you're poisoning yourself chemically, it is unfair to expect that Shankar will have an impact on it. Because I my intention is to create an impact in Shankar. But what I am doing is because me getting angry or hating something or me annoying you, I am poisoning myself. Therefore, I get cancer and uh, all the physical ailments. And what my job, my definition for myself is very simple. Can I be in an equanimous state when I'm working on the most stressful problems and still deliver what is expected, what I signed up for? Well, that's a very pragmatic definition. I'm trying to summarize a lot of things that you said. One is that identity is very much contextual. And in different contexts, the identity will be different. Just like pointers in computers, what it points to depends on what the content is. And therefore, <laughs> it's contextual. Very interesting. Yes. Another is that emotions. That is something that's not there in most computers that we know of. Even understanding beyond logic is still not there. But there's some attempts to go beyond uh, logic towards what's called humanized AI. And uh, there, the real challenge from what you're telling me is emotions don't have to be erratic motions, something that's completely uncontrolled. We are completely succumbing to them and the emotion controls us and messes up the logic or the context in which we are rather than we having emotions and understanding it. So this is a very pragmatic definition of all these things. So at this point, one of the things I find is what I call Russell's paradox. In the, in the midst of everything, you're like, okay, I've figured it out. I'm happy now. I can do everything. And suddenly there is this, maybe a child dies or maybe somebody gets COVID or maybe you, you run out of money and have to figure out what to do. That's where the paradoxes are. You want to yeah. be joyful. You want to be blissful and you can't sustain it. How do you yeah. deal with these kinds of things? 
Beautiful. So I think I like the fact how you're build connecting it back to humanized AI and the and the dilemmas. Well, in in Sanskrit, we call it as dharma sankatas. These are all challenges that we face. Damned if you do or damned if you don't. Catch twenty twos and whatever other names that we are given to it. In my coaching language, we call it as polarities. Polarities is two extremes that we have. Both of them are required. It is like inhalation and exhalation. When life happens. we cannot just say i want only the good things of life oh let the bad things of life go to shankar that doesn't work that way life is a package just like inhalation and exhalation you do both of them together you do happiness and you do sad you do uh, success and you do failure all of them are together but in our mind what we have created is oh i want only success i don't i let somebody else take all the failures i want only money somebody else take all poverty this doesn't work that way there is a beautiful articulation by clay christians in a nice ted talk he says harvard graduates when they reconnect back every 5 years every 10 years all of them are very smart very successful but it turns out that they have divorces and a whole bunch of other things that are going on health problems when did they choose after graduating saying okay i'm going to have a health problem at this age i'm going to divorce my wife at this age my son will not talk to me at this age this is not what we plan out to just like in a nokia company nobody said we are going to go bankrupt at some point in time our technology will become obsolescent at some point and yet it happens to us because we are not paying attention to what we need to pay attention to we want to say that we want to success definitely all of us want that if you convert that success into well being this is one word where we can say even if i get the good news and the bad news i can treat this equally with equanimity there is a nice small story if you allow me i'll, I'll share that quickly there is a chinese gentleman who has a son who goes out and gets a wild horse into his house people come and ask him and say oh wow you got a wild horse now you have you're rich rich poor who knows and the next day his son starts riding the horse he falls down and people come and say oh no the horse was a bad luck for you and then he says bad luck good luck who knows and then the third day the the minister the king's army men they come and say we are recruiting people and therefore this guy was injured therefore he doesn't have to go your son doesn't have to go get enro endl so that's a good news so it goes on like this the idea is that one good news is bad news all of them can be taken in equally so coming back to your question of dilemmas and dharma sankatas yes bad things can happen and bad things do happen i'm not saying you you have to be saint about it if you feel sad feel that emotion see how quickly can you come back to normal because at the end of the day there are other things that are good that is also happening what we confuse is our psychological drama which is what is happening in our head for existential drama existential is not a drama it's a reality it is like going to a movie when the hero dies we start crying and we come home and cry and you know start being bad to our wife or whatever it is that's not true that's a silver reality we switch out of that and in this particular case i'm not saying we should switch out of it as quickly or it should be on command or like turning off a switch but you can do it it can be practiced when we are dealing with paradoxes answers cannot be short so uh, let me get back to digital logic because uh, i enjoy comparing digital logic with the logic of the heart you cannot just have zero and one right and wrong true and false so we introduce two other things one is called x and the other is called z x means unpredictable a lot of life is unpredictable z means unattached literally disconnected from zero and one so whatever zero and one may be but i'm going to step back from it are you talking about that when you're talking about equanimity and if so how can this now it's no longer binary logic at least you have zero one x and z and the mathematics get very very complicated but it actually works in unpredictable unknown quantities also so to deal with the paradoxes of binary life good and bad <laughs> right and wrong successful and unsuccessful money and money there is a money which is all about external money money wins the jewel of the heart dealing with that what is equanimity really well it is at simply put in a binary world let's say i good things things such a, which i want and things which i don't want i want more of things that i want you are adding the other two dimensions what i call like and dislike want and don't want is like i want a million dollar that is a want what i like is fundamentally i want to be abundant and that is what i don't know how to convey it. the money is for some other reason because i want to be not tethered to something where i don't have to be for example if people who are working 9 to 5 they are looking forward to tgif which is because they can go back and and enjoy 
if all seven days, if they can be enjoying and still the mortgage and other things are paid for, then technically they would want to do that. So the, the question is what and don't want, like and don't like, are the two axes is, is one way to look at it. And that is what you may be calling it as X and Y's. That is one way to look at it. But I want to go slightly deeper than this, because to me, at the end of the day, if you were to look at a geometric, any polarities will give you 180 up and 180 down, it's 360 degrees. A triangle also gives you 360 degrees enclosed angle. And then square also, which is four, all four put together gives you 360. But the moment you go to five and six and seven pentagons and hexagons, and there is in more than 720 included angles comes up. This is important. Why I'm saying that is our brain can handle multiple beyond three as easily as we know. And therefore, we tend to make up a lot of things in the mind. And that is one of the places where disassociation from what we think is the reality and what actually is the reality is comes into play. For example, what we see out in the world is brought through our senses into our mind for processing. The five senses brings these input, which is what I call impressions. And then there is a processing layer that happens, which is a perception. And then an output layer that happens, which is the expression. For us to get the impression accurately as real as possible, we need high fidelity. What we happens is because our mind is coloring with the likes and dislikes and want and don't want, we have selective memory. We pick up only those elements that we want and ignores the ones which you don't want. Therefore, our selective percept selective impression creates partial perception. When we express it, we only express what another level of filter. Therefore, we express what we kosherly express or politically correct we express. So multiple levels of filters and layers. This is what detachment causes and this is what detachment need to bring about. Fundamentally, these are the tools and techniques and science we can explore if you go deeper. And we can do it in a scientific, methodical way, in a subjective observation. What I'm saying is simply this. If it works for me and I tell you, hey, Shankar, this is what works for me and you try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, discard it. We can just use our intellect and use our discernment to figure out where the polarities are, where the conflicts are and work beyond them. And this is what I call transcending. Transcending is both you include and extend using the tools that you have and go beyond that to explore tools that you need to acquire. At this point of time, we have only acquired tools through intellect. The way in which we acquire that is through learning and training. And this is our schooling system. If you do experience-based learning, whereas you are the experience and you are the experiencer, you are observing yourself, there are amazing things possible. For example, if I ask you, if I touch you any part, if I pull out one small thing from you, if I pull you, you'll be able to notice I'm doing something to you. Whereas there's so much activity happening inside your body. There is a cancer cell that invaded. You are having a pain in your stomach. Only it surfaces to a certain level, certain degree manifestation, then only you'll come to know. When you get a headache, you'll know. But there are happening at a cellular level. Can you monitor that? And this is the level it is possible to explore. And these are all inner sciences and technologies. You've definitely reduced the signal to noise ratio for me. Otherwise, it's all noise. This is great stuff. I'm really excited about it. You talked about dissociation. You talked about detachment. Is it possible at some point, rather than getting attached to this idea of detachment, can we detach ourselves from the idea of detachment so that we can be totally free? The short answer is yes. It is tied to the other point which I mentioned earlier. It is to do tied to your identity. We talk about inner sciences and outer sciences. What is inside? The moment I get inside my skin, is it inside? In one sense, if I get my inside my mind, brain or thought process, like let me look inside your thought process, is that inside? Maybe. We don't know. There is a gradation of gross to subtle to causal. What? causes me to function any given day? What causes me to be my full essence? What causes me to express some anger and get back to my you know, white sheet, white paper state? I'll make it very simple. You take a seed, let's say it's acorn or oak tree, whatever is, is a seed for. It has a full potential of the whole big tree within it, but you have to plant it. It had to break the shell open and come out as a sapling and survive the initial you know, fragile state of getting eaten by a goat or somebody stepping on it. Finally, over a period of time, given enough resources like water or soil nutrition, it can grow to 200 feet, 300 feet tall, and it can live for hundreds of years. But the same potential was there in the sea. And same is the case with our birth also, right? We have one sperm and one egg got mixed together. And here we are now swamp. 
imagine when you talk about full moon to new moon, we have different names. Yet you and I, Shankar, from birth, you're Shankar and, you know, right till death, I'll be money. The reason for that is we think that we have a fixed identity. Our identity has to shift from me being a body, me being a mind. Then the detachment is possible. Just like any technique in the inner sciences also, there are pre-education that are required for you to understand, oh, these are the basics, these are the tools with which I function. Once you learn these tools, you can apply it to yourself and function it. And detachment is possible. And detachment in this particular case is the essence observing the mind. If you are conscious, you can observe yourself what your mind is doing. And what would detachment from being detached look like? You can always engage fully. You are more involved when you're kicking a ball because you're totally focused on playing a game. When I was coding, I used to spend days and debugging. Similarly, when I was a business school, I was trying to solve a business problem. I was completely attached. What was different was I also had likes and dislikes. I wanted this outcome. When I do a research, when, this, when the outcome that you want comes out, that's great. But the outcome that you want doesn't come out. Still, it is research unless you don't have integrity. If somebody paid you money to say this is the outcome you want to publish in your paper, that's not considered research. Therefore, you have to be attached back again in the right way. There are some techniques around right and wrong. What I call enlivening and deadening. Something gives you life and you are attaching to that. That's great. If I'm doing something for this kid to come alive and learn something new, I, I do that with my clients. A lot of successful people, when they go through the coaching, they come alive. And that's what energizes me. And that is the right way to attach yourself back again. Such an amazing discussion. We could go on forever. I truly appreciate you talking about this inner and outer journey and how they don't have to be separate, that they can be together. You can still be engaged in the stock market, you can still be doing the things that you do normally. Are you still engaged in that sense in the outer world and still Absolutely. finding your inner joy? Absolutely. You're not talking about going to a cave and sitting quietly there. It is being very much in life. And I have a wife and two daughters and I have a dog. I engage with clients who are highly successful in the technology world. I coach every day. I meet with clients, listen to their challenges and support them in the process of they getting in life. I was working with a senior level executive in one of the technology company. We were chatting about a couple of things. He wanted to know, tell me what books I've read, what changes I've made, what impacts I've created. Initially, I was like, what? Why is he asking me all this question? Was he testing me? That's kind of the emotion that came up for me. I said, oh, no, no, no. He's asking legitimate question. Let me answer that. When I answered it, when we started engaging in that assignment, he had certain goals. Within the first session itself, he got what we wanted. And by the third and fourth session, when he was in London and he was driving around, he went into trans state and a couple of things he came back and reported to me saying that money, this all came because of our conversation. That was enlivening for me. The whole feedback loop of working with the clients, enlivening them, and they coming back and reporting to me is the beauty that I'm looking forward to. That's amazing. A lot of people go through loneliness, anxiety in the midst of plenty. What do you recommend? What we have done with technology is we have misused it. Social media, which was supposed to connect us all together, has alienated it. I'm deeply involved in AI land as well. Technology doesn't have intention. It only magnifies or reduces the distance. With the AI, we think that it can have intentionality, which is a possibility. Coming back to your recommendation, become aware of what you are and what your essence is. Also, think back a couple of years when we were in COVID, how family were polarized to, to take vaccine or not take vaccine. So understand that polarization and both sides of the spectrum. Let's be aware of what technology and other challenges are bringing us, asking us to raise our capabilities and our competencies as a leader and as technologists to solve human problems. If you do this for this decade, we can get through amazing things. There are significant challenges in front of us, climate change, AI. All of us can only be solved if we work together. You are coming alive. Your family members, others, they, they also come alive. At the end of the day, it's all one consciousness. Thank you. Such a beautiful conversation. This is why I talk to people to get diverse perspectives. It's not enough just to know the technology out there because at the end of the day, it's we who will be using this technology or maybe the technology will be using us. You never know. We need to understand our relationship with technology and our relationship with each other. So thank you for reminding us money to not just talk about money, but also the inner consciousness and the inner yearnings 
And uh, thank you also for giving simple but practical recommendations. And to your people out there, I want to hear from you. Let's continue the dialogue.